Um, again, thank you all for coming. I'll, I'll quickly get through some announcements and then we'll get on to our presentation. If you have a phone or anything that makes noise, if you could silence that so we don't um, get distracted with that. Um, I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater. And um, we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983, as many of you know. Um, we've been able to present lectures to hundreds of people with hundreds of our um, faculty and staff members over the years. So thank you for having us. We're happy to be here. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce today's speaker. This is Jennifer Motzko. She's the head of archives at UW-Whitewater. She holds a BA in history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's degree in master's degrees in history and library information science from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Jennifer has over 14 years of experience working in both corporate and academic archives. She began her archival career with the Harley Davidson Motor Company as a museum technician, but spent over 10 years as manuscript archivist for the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. In 2018, she moved back to Wisconsin to head the Archives and Area Research Center at UW-Whitewater, where she manages university records, genealogical resources, and manuscript collections that document the agricultural, business, and supernatural history of southeastern Wisconsin. Please welcome Jennifer Motzko. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, this is a topic that's really exciting, and I kind of thought that there would be a lot of people that would be curious just from the title alone. Um, <laughs> a little background on how I became interested in this in the first place. Um, I often am asked, as you heard in my introduction, about the supernatural history of Whitewater, the uh, haunted book, the witch's tower, et cetera. And I'm really not much of a person who believes in ghosts. So when folks come to the archives, I really like to point them to the things that are real and true and uh, the history that surrounds those. So I learned about the Poison Widow from a colleague and began looking at the court case, which we have in the archives. And um, many of the other records that are surrounding this case are also housed um, it, with the archives. And so, you know, why not take a look? Also, I work with the history department on campus to teach sessions on primary source research, um, particularly their historical methods class. And I, I like to bring out documents from the archives and have them uh, you know, engage with the physical materials. So I like to start by asking my class, you find out that a murder has taken place in Whitewater. What types of primary sources are you going to find? How are you going to discover them? And how do you use them to support your own argument? So true crime is a topic that really seems to engage the students. And what is more interesting to research than the mystery behind a murder? And really, at the end of class, I like to ask them, who is really guilty of this crime and why? So in 2003, Linda Godfrey uh, published a book on this, the showed case, uh, the, which is titled The Poison Widow, A True Story of Sin, Strychnine, and Murder. It kind of captures the facts and presents the case much like a, a documentary on Netflix. It's a really enjoyable read, so if you are still interested in the case um, after this, you know, definitely check it out from the public library. I know they have many copies. In fact, I keep checking out their copy. Um, <laughs> so after reading the book and looking through some of these primary sources, I began to think about factors that weren't really covered in the book or weren't discussed in depth. And I wanted to look at the case in context of the time period to examine the influence of the press in shaping public opinion. Um, exploring the effects these crimes had on her family, particularly her children, and investigate how an insanity defense could have changed the outcome of this trial. So my research is really, really in its infancy, but I hope to give you some things to think about each of these as they pertain to the case. So let's begin. The showed family. <laughs> Edward over here it was 
born in Jefferson County on a farm south of Rome. He attended the normal school, which is now UW-Whitewater. Uh, in 1892 through 1894, he received a certificate in elementary education. He taught for a few years and later bought a farm near Palmyra, near the Code family farm. And this here is Myrtle Code. And she uh, grew up on this farm and attended school through about the eighth grade. On October 4th, 2004, Edward married Myrtle, and she was 17 at the time, and he was 33. Uh, right. Ooh. <laughs> in the following years, they had um, five children. The first was a stillbirth, and then they had their uh, Ralph, Delbert, May, and Lawrence, all of these little guys over here. Uh, then, they, um, in 2017, they spent $8,000 to buy a 34-acre farm up here on the top. I know this is a really hard map to see. This is the plat map um, for Walworth County. Down here in this red circle is where the normal school is, UW, you know, what's now UW-Whitewater. Um, the house would have stood here on the corner of what's Prince and Pratt, which is now Starin Road. And... Um, pretty much where the um, Benson Dormitory or the Drumlin Hall um, uh, cafeteria is right now. So they live basically right on campus. Well, what wasn't campus at the time? Um, <laughs> Edward ran a dairy. He had Guernsey cows. Those have high milk fats, so ever, or butter fats, so they, you know, good to have those. Um, and a slew of Rhode Island red chickens. Um, he had a milk route in Whitewater, um, supplying milk to the community. And from time to time, he ran ads in the Whitewater Register to sell some of his heifers and his chickens. Uh, the Shodes really became part of the community. Uh, they were members of the Me Methodist Episcopal Church, where Edward would sometimes sing in the choir, and Myrtle led the church church's social auxiliary. So the two oldest, let's see, where was I? Yep, yep, that's right. Um, the two oldest children, um, Mm -hmm. uh, Ralph and Delbert attended the, the normal high school. So we weren't just a normal college. We had a high school and a, and a grade school, grammar school as well. So they attended the normal high school and really were involved in um, activities both in and outside of school. Delbert attended the YMCA camps in the summer. Ralph was the class president one year. Uh, he played basketball um, and ran track. Um, as, as many community members did, they took in lodgers into their homes because at that point in time, the school did not have dormitories. So if you were from out of town, you needed to find someone to live with in town. So in September of 1921, the Shods took in two lodgers, Frank Brett Snyder and Ernest, Ernst Kufel. So here's Ernest. Ernst. He went by Ernst or Ernest. Um, he often signed his name Ernst, so I will try to call him Ernst. Um, he was born and raised in Watertown, and he worked as a farm laborer there. He joined the Army in 1917 to fight in World War I. He served as a private, working um, in aircraft production. Um, this is his 1922 yearbook photo. Uh, when he signed up for the Army, he described himself as tall and slender with blue eyes and light brown hair. So, mm. <laughs> so he comes to Whitewater to study business at the normal school. Uh, I can tell you his grades weren't really great, but uh, Maybe he was a bit distracted by other things. Um, Kufel would help Mrs. Shod around the house. He'd wash dishes, sweep the floors, wash the windows. Um, and the other lodger, uh, Brett Schneider, would later testify that Kufel said he had fallen in love with Mrs. Shod at first sight. So when you have two gentlemen in love with the same woman, bad things are bound to happen. So there you go. Uh, not even a year later, Mr. Show dies on March 18th, 1922. Um, this article up here reads, uh, Mr. Shada, because he was either called Shada or Sh Shad, um, had been confined to his bed with jaundice for more than a week and appeared to be recovering. But on Friday night, excessive vomiting brought on hemorrhage, and he passed away quite unexpectedly about 3 a.m. on Saturday morning. 
So um, at the time when he was confined to bed, he had his oldest son and Myrtle's father were helping with the milk route. Um, he seemed to be getting better. Um, it, later, Myrtle's uh, words about that night, she said, I was asleep. He woke me up, and he said, Myrtle, I feel so funny. I got up, and he says, my toes are stiff. I tried to rub them, and he told me not to because it hurt him. I thought it, it, he was into a fit. He said, what is the matter with me? I said, Ed, I don't know. So Myrtle tried, or said she tried to call the doctor and was unable to get through to the operator. We all remember when we had to call the operator first. And <laughs> finally, she sent um, her old, oldest son, Ralph, um, to, to get the doctor. And, but by the time the doctor arrived, Ed was dead. Um, the doctor said that he died of natural causes, um, and because the ground was not thawed enough in, in March to bury the body, uh, he was interred in a vault, and then he was later buried in the Hillside Cemetery. And so life goes on. Um, on April 17th, Myrtle holds this auction to sell her 10 cows and three horses and 75 chickens, as well as um, alfalfa and farm implements. Um, in July of that year, she sells the property and moves to Main Street, where she opens a boarding house for, for the female students on campus. She's feeding about 25 to 30 uh, students a day. Um, Ernst leaves Whitewater. Uh, he goes to attend the Wauwatosa County Agricultural School. Um, Mrs. Shaw and, and Mr. Kufel remain correspondents. He visits Whitewater on occasion. Um, in the spring of 1923, uh, he moves to McGrath, Minnesota. And um, at, during the summer of 1923, Mrs. Shaw uh, drove up with her son Delbert to visit Mr. Kufel for, for 15 days. Otherwise, life continues until September of 1923. Ah! In mid-September, Mrs. Shaw purchases one-eighth bottle of strychnine from the H.J. Uh, O'Connor drugstore. And at the J.C. Cox grocery store, she purchases 15 cents worth of candy. She cut into the bonbons and filled them with strychnine. On September 21st, she asked Ralph to drive the rest of the children to the country to get some potatoes. So she rode with them in the car for a few blocks. She got out to send them on their way. She gave them each a piece of candy. Ralph puts the entire piece of candy in his mouth, and then he spits it out because it's just really nasty and bitter. Strychnine, and anybody has a chance to taste it, is really bitter. Yeah, don't. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mrs. Shaw then tells the rest of the children to spit their candy out. She, she wipes um, out the little five-year-old Lawrence's mouth with her hanky. She tells the children she had um, bought the candy from a strange lady and was afraid that it might be poisoned and asked them to come back to the doctor. So Ralph declared, uh, it's just bitter candy, and he proceeded to get in the car with the kids and drive them out into the country. Um, he drove about four miles out of town, and all of a sudden, since he had taken in the most poison, uh, that starts to take effect. His limbs start getting stiff. He's unable to stop the car, and his 13-year-old brother, Delbert, uh, was able to turn the car around and start driving them back to the city. So uh, meanwhile, Mrs. Shobe, she went back um, to her house. She got a couple of pans, and she went across the street to get some tomatoes from a neighbor. Um, she broke down crying at the neighbors, telling them the same story about this strange candy lady and, um, and that she was afraid it was poisoned, and the children had, um, had taken some of it and, and gone off into the country. So on her way home, um, she, she sees Professor Cotton. He worked at, at the university and asked him to, to drive out after the children to, to go and get them. Uh, but just as he was about to go, the, the children made it back into town. They were, um, Ralph was taken to Dr. Um, Dykey, and he recovered. Um, none of the children suffered any other effects from the poison. So the doctor calls the district attorney's office about 11.30 Friday evening to report this crime. Um, he had uh, been the doctor called the night that Mr. Shad had died in March of 1922. 
And he said that at the time, he thought Mr. Shaw might have been poisoned, but that he had thought that it might have been suicide because he had been so very sick. So out of consideration for this newly widowed Mrs. Shode and her family, he did not report it. Um, Mrs. Shode's taken into custody on Saturday and escorted to Elkhorn to be questioned by the district attorney, Mr. Godfrey. She is questioned for four hours before she signs a two-page typed confession, and it says, Quote, at the time I put the strychnine into the candy, I intended to give it to the children. I knew that the strychnine was poison and that it would kill the children. I don't know why I put the strychnine in the candy for the children. I can't tell you at this time why I did it. That's what it says up here at the top. And she also confesses to killing her husband. Two for one, um, stating that she put strychnine into his prune juice and leaving it for him on the bedroom dresser uh, to drink. Her confession reads, at the time I said it there, I knew that the strychnine was poison and that my husband would die if he drank it. I don't know why I poisoned my husband. I just did it. So she confessed to both of them, but we really don't have a motive behind it, right? She didn't know why she did it. She just wanted to get rid of them. Uh, so, <laughs> um, after the confession, Mrs. Shode uh, has a breakdown. She's in a semi-conscious state for several days. She was, um, as the headlines say, she was hysterical. She was deranged, um, and she was irrational. All things us women tend to be from time to time. Um, testimony from the jail worker said that she would squirm on the bed and say, get that man, get that man, he is a bad man. Um, and as she seemed to come out of her hysteria, she requested to speak to the county sheriff, Mr. Wiley, and confess that it was Ernst Kufel who had mixed the strychnine into the prune juice, which she gave to her husband. Take note of this hysterical break. I'm going to talk more a little bit about it later. Um, newspapers report that she was about to plead guilty, but was so hysterical, a plea of not guilty was entered on her behalf. Um, this, this newspaper article says, the report comes from Elkhorn that she is almost constantly hysterical and that unless she quiets down, a mental break can be expected. She was, like I said, prepared to plead guilty to the charge of her condition, of, um, but her condition of hysteria prompted Justice Line to enter a plea of not guilty for her. Mrs. Myrtle Shaw lies in the county jail in Elkhorn. The extreme hysteria which threatened her reason last week has passed, but she is very weak and is very carefully nursed back to normal strength. So she's got her mental derangement. Very, um, so anyway, the plot thickens. <laughs> Kuvel comes back down from Minnesota to answer questions about the crime. And while he swears he did not participate in or know about the crime beforehand, he's charged with murder and, ex and as an accessory to murder and held over for trial. Um, some of the headlines here, he said he's in custody, he was arraigned, he, had, he was held um, for uh, $2,000 bonds, that was his, um, and that Mrs. Shaw will not plead guilty but fight Kufel. Um, one says that he is being held as a witness, and one says lover held for part and showed poisoning case. So evidence of an affair between Mrs. Kufel, or Mr. Kufel and Mrs. Shaw um, is uncovered. The almost daily letters between Ernst and Myrtle, Myrtle um, surface. In one, they actually bet each other that they would be married be before 1928. In another, he jokes about the usefulness of her pretty little mouth. Um, Ernst and Myrtle spend weekends at hotels in Milwaukee and Chicago, often registering as husband and wife. Their correspondence seems to speak to Ernst's guilt at times in the death of Mr. Shad. Uh, in a letter dated September 15th, 1923, this is about a week before she tries to poison her children, Ernst writes, I had an awful dream this morning. I dreamed that I was carrying a corpse. Well, I don't think you care to read about my dream. It was not very much, only as though I was carrying Ed on a stretcher on the streets of Watertown. Two others were carrying at the head end. It does seem funny how a person does dream something. I think it was because I was thinking of the farm and how we fooled around, etc., as I was boarding at your place. 
Mm, right? <laughs> Um, in several letters, Kufel mentions the children and how they might not be a welcome part of the family. Um, you know, he talks about marrying her from time to time. Um, in his letter dated September 11th, 1923, um, he talks about being lonely, but d he doesn't want Myrtle to rent out her house in Whitewater and bring the children to Minnesota. He says, quote, you know as well and better than I do that it is quite difficult to satisfy five much more than just one. <laughs> he says he would be very strict with the children, does not want Ralph under his roof, stating, quote, the worst years are from 18 to 25, I believe. I think I agree. Um, <laughs> Myrtle and Ernst are, are held over for trial. Uh, that would begin in February. So <laughs> there he is again. Um, he goes on trial on February 15th, 1924. And it, it becomes this very he said, she said case, right? Because they were the only two people there. Um, Mrs. Show testifies for hours on the first day. The entire testimony actually uh, comes out to 250 double-spaced typed pages that we have in the archives. Um, so I haven't really actually read all of it just yet. Um, she said that Ernst offered to mix up some of the, uh, some medicine to help the ailing Mr. Showed. Kufel got out the prune juice and took the strychnine down from the cupboard. Myrtle testifies, quote, just as he took it down, I says, Ernst, that's poison. He says, all medicine is poison, don't you know? I am only going to fix enough to deaden the pain. Myrtle claims, contrary to her first confession, that she did not know that the prune juice would kill her husband because she believed what Ernst told her. Uh, she also, also spoke about a conversation she had while Ernst um, uh, visited, while she had visited him in McGrath um, during the summer of 1923. He told her they should, quote, do them like we did with the mister, meaning um, take care of the children in the same manner. The doctor and undertaker testified to their belief that Mr. Shaw died of poison. Um, Shaw had been disinterred shortly after, uh, you know, so that they could take some of his organs to Madison to test for strychnine. I'm really not even 100% sure how one tested for strychnine 100 years ago, but um, it was that they looked at stomach contents. Um, so, let's see. On the second day, Ernst took the stand in his own defense. He denied any knowledge of the poisonings beforehand. Uh, to the newspapers, he comes across as the confident war veteran, um, as opposed to the slight and pale Mrs. Showed. In, this cl in his closing arguments, Kufel's attorney, who is W.C. Zabel, describes Kufel as, quote, the victim of a vampire who sang in the church choir while her own hands were dripping with blood. And, and not to be outdone, uh, J.W. Page, the attorney for the state, argued that both Kufel and Mrs. Showed were guilty of murder. He declared, quote, their intimate relations and unholy love and spoke of Kufel as a viper in the bosom of the Showed family. So there's a viper, a vampire, all really bad things happening. Um, it even, you know, it made it into the newspaper. She's branded as a vampire in the press. Mrs. Showed lied, he says. Um, this is my favorite, because I don't know where this even came out in the testimony. Kufel danced after he put poison in cup, victim's widow says. So I haven't gotten to that part, but I can see him maybe doing a jig. Anyway... The jury deliberates for about two hours and returns with a verdict of not guilty of murder and not guilty of conspiring with Mrs. Shaw to commit murder. A uh, cheer goes up in the courtroom at the announcement of his acquittal. And Mrs. Uh, Kufel shook hands with the jurors as they left the courtroom. Um, there was also something that had to do with, there was a dog that was like the mascot, and he went and hung out with the jury in the jury box during the trial. This also made the newspaper at that point in time. Um, so something, I can't remember the dog's name, but it was very important. Um, Mrs. Shaw's trial is set to begin the following day, February 20th, um, her son Lawrence's sixth birthday. And there she is. Um, as the trial set to begin, Mrs. Shaw's attorneys meet with um, the attorneys for the state. They agree to lessen the charges to manslaughter in the first degree uh, and four counts of attempted murder of her children. She pleads guilty and faces a sentence of up to 50 years in state prison at Waupon. 
So she doesn't even have a trial. She basically just pleads out on the day. Um, it, you know, Mrs. Shod enters pleas of guilty to five prison charges. Mrs. Shod uh, pleads guilty of manslaughter. She admits poisoning husband and attempting lives of children. Um, and I should admit that this is like national news because this photograph or you know drawing of her is um, taken from the St. Louis Post Dispatch. So it made news in um, St. Louis, in Tennessee, in Buffalo, um, in some small newspapers in um, New York City. So the following day, uh, she is sent her. Um, She's sentenced to 20 years in prison, 10 years for the manslaughter of her husband, plus 10 years for attempting to poison her children. It really came out to she got 10 years for her husband's murder. She got uh, 10 years for each of her children, but she served the children's sentences um, concurrently and then the two sentences consecutively. So um, uh, she would be, quote, punished as to each of them by confinement to hard labor, the first day of confinement to be solitary. So then we kind of come back again to this. After the verdict, Mrs. Shaw collapses. She seems to undergo another mental break. She spends a week recovering in the Alcorn jail before she being sent to Waupon. Um, you know, this woman in a, a fragile mental state. Um, the Whitewater Register reports she's, uh, the mental strain she's undergone and is still undergoing caused her to collapse again the first of the week and for a time her attendants were very much alarmed about her. So we see that she has. And when she gets to, to prison, her mental condition continues to worsen. She is classed as, quote, an extreme neurotic. Uh, she's morose and nervous, crying often, is unable to sleep. She loses 20 pounds in the first year and weighs just over 100 pounds in May of, of uh, 1925. She's given bromides for her nerves and al uh, alanol, a, a barbiturate, uh, to help with her sleep. Um, the prison seems uh, to be this state of the art with their treatments as they also offer violet ray treatment daily. So this is a violet ray uh, gun right here. It was patented in the mid-1920s, um, and the electrodes, like I said, the one pictured here, are used to heal a number of problems. Uh, the high-frequency currents that were attached to a vacuum tube or electrode emitted a violet-colored light when in use. So this was not supposed to be shock therapy, but light therapy. Um, the electrodes would be applied to the area that needed attention. Um, and while they didn't shock the system, they could leave burns if they were turned up too high or left in contact with the, the skin too long. And after a number of lawsuits, most of these were taken off the market in the 1940s. So. So despite, maybe because of all of those treatments, uh, Mrs. Shaw's health remained poor. And just a year into her prison, imprisonment, uh, she applies to G Governor Blaine for a pardon of her case. Her mental condition and the fact that her children needed her in their lives were the main reasons that were given for, for this request for clemency. The petition was signed by Mrs. Shaw's brother and sister, as well as her two oldest children, Ralph and Delbert. So she was denied a pardon in 1925 and again in 1927. Um, the, this is an, a bit from the prison physician. He, the, it, that is said prison physician has volunteered his opinion that unless she's released shortly, she will undergo a complete mental breakdown. And in his words, we will have her over here before long, meaning the prison hospital for the insane. So uh, that the physical and mental condition of said Myrtle Shod therefore will warrant executive clemency. She did. <laughs> get pardoned in January of 1929. Governor Zim Zimmerman, on his way out of, out of office, gave Mrs. Shod a conditional pardon. At the time, she's now 42 years old. She's freed from prison. And um, the pardon says, now therefore ye know ye that in consideration of the premises, I, as governor of the state of Wisconsin, do by these present commute the sentence of the above name Myrtle showed to a sentence of 14 years, the same to the date from the day of the original sentence. 
I'm not quite, so he's commuting the last 14 years of her sentence is what he's saying. And the Whitewater Register um, reports that she is an, of an appearance of a woman of 60. She is thin and frail and somewhat stooped. The prison experience broke her spirit, though she received the kindest treatment from those connected with the institution. Also, this article, though, goes on to say, <clears throat> so far as Mrs. Showed is concerned, her broken health and spirit ensured society against future crime, but whether or not her punishment has been sufficiently severe to defer other women with a sex complex from doing away with an unwanted husband is another matter. A majority of Whitewater people hold to the opinion that the punishment was altogether for that purpose, meaning her punishment was meant to deter other women from killing their husbands. And by pardoning her, she was an example of how women uh, would not be held accountable for these crimes, right? Obviously. Um, so life after prison. What did she do? Um, there really isn't that much documentary uh, evidence. She's paroled to the home of um, Otis M. Johnson, who is a uh, reverend at the um, Methodist Church in Fond du Lac, um, and spends some time there. Um, according to the Godfrey book, she may have worked as a maid in Oshkosh for a time, or ran a boarding house in Milwaukee, or visited Nebraska, possibly to sell some property that she and Mrs. Mr. Shaw owned there. Um, but at what she did <laughs> is, um, and again, according to the Godfrey book, is put an ad in the newspaper, the Lonely Hearts ad, because she needed herself a new husband. <laughs> And she married Charles McGarren on December 26, 1935. Um, and then they moved to Zion, Illinois, and opened a boarding house. So she's kind of having the sort of same life over again. Um, this is from the 1940 census. It has the two of them um, listed as uh, 58 and 54 years old. And then they had this um, number of, they had nine lodgers, um, men and women, some divorced, some single, some married. So, um, I thought I had one more slide in here. Anyway, she did, she passed away in, um, 1972. So we're coming to the end of Myrtle. Um, so she lived a long life afterwards. And now I kind of want to come back to these three ideas I had of, um, the media and the effect on her children and, and mental illness. So, you know, the media... I mean, as then, as now, um, did not always report things correctly. Uh, we have that she is going to face the formal charge of attempted murder of one child. Um, and that child was uh, Delbert, who was the second child, who was not the one who was really even poisoned. Um, at one point, they report that um, Kufel is cleared in the poison plot and exonerated by the district attorney. And they also start to, you know, brand her as the poison widow. I didn't come up with that catchy title. It was there in the newspapers at the time. And it's like today with serial killers where they, you know, there's the Green River Killer. And, you, you know, once they have a name, that sticks with them. And how does that really, you know, how does that really affect the people who are involved with judging the case um, at the time? So... This is something I'm still kind of playing around with and researching a little bit more. And I'd mentioned the children. And um, despite her pleas and her pardons, um, she didn't return to her children when she, she got out. I said that she went to all these other places, but um, I, I can't confirm that she ever really saw them again. It does mention in the Godfrey book that she might have seen her daughter, but um, she didn't cite her sources, so I don't know where she got that information from. But uh, Ralph, who's her oldest, um, stayed in Whitewater to finish high school. He boarded with another family. Um, this is Ralph's yearbook photo from 1926. Uh, uh, he then went to Stout and um, and was the class of 1929. Delbert, ooh, who I forgot to label over here, um, stayed in Whitewater also to finish high school. I don't really have a whole lot of information um, other than I think he got into a car accident in the 1940s. 
that was in the newspaper. Um, May moved to Union Grove with her aunt, and I have found nothing on her after that. Again, I have just started to dig into this a little bit more. Um, Lawrence uh, moved to Dousman and also moved in with another aunt. These were both sisters of Mrs. Shode, so they lived with her family, not his family, even though they both had living family. And um, he went on to attend um, Stout as well and graduated 10 years later. Um, Ralph and Lawrence both became industrial art teachers. Uh, one moved to Michigan and one moved to Kansas City uh, to teach. So it seemed like at the time they, you know, um, in between the poisoning and the, the testifying, both of the oldest boys testified in the Kufel trial, um, that they really continue to have this normal life. They're reported in the newspaper as being, you know, playing on the basketball team and running track and participating in the debate club. And it just seems kind of really odd to me that that, that seems to continue on. And the same thing in that they, they really supported their mother through their, her petition to pardon as well. So I, you know, that one is, I don't know. I'm, I'm still, like I said, digging into that one. I really want to track that down a little bit more. And then the third one was uh, this, this thought about claiming temporary insanity. Um, and I had like, so much information to go over, but I really only want to talk for another like five minutes. So we'll see. This is like close to my last slide, but it is a lot of information. So according to the state statutes, an insanity plea must be entered at the time of arraignment, which meant that when she was initially charged, she was having this mental breakdown, and the judge put in that plea of not guilty. She would have had to plead guilty um, by temporary or by insanity at that point in time, and that didn't happen. And then, never after can you do that. So, you know, is there a little bit of, you know, her lawyers? weren't pushing for this? Was this something that they weren't thinking about at the time? Yes, she confessed to the crime. She didn't have a lawyer with her at that time. Um, you know, what kind of mental strain was, uh, you know, and what sort of influence did Kufel have over her actions? So um, there was a, a great article that was written by Gregory Gramling on the, called The Insanity in Criminal Cases in Wisconsin, which was published in 1933 in the Marquette Law Review. And it really covered all of these, these early cases and case law that was established around insanity defenses at that point in time. Um, the, this first case, Bennett versus State, uh, you know, at the circuit court level, um, the, they're really focused on the ability to know right from wrong and, and that plan, being able to plan a crime is a sign of sanity. And um, so if he didn't know, quote, if he didn't know that he'd killed him, um, that it was wrong to kill him by reason of mental disease to deliberate and premeditate the homicide, then you should find that he was insane. But if he had sufficient power of mind and will to deliberate, to premeditate, then you should find that he was sane. Um, and this case then went to the Supreme Court where they were like, ah, uh, just because he was smart enough to think about the crime ahead of time and to plan doesn't necessarily mean he was sane. Um, so the, there also, you know, it was discussed that there must be this absence of power to determine properly the true nature and character of the crime. And I'm like, that kind of gets, it starts to get a little bit squishy. But in the showed case, um, she did plan to poison the children. She bought the candy, she bought the poison, um, but did she have this, an inability to control this impulse of mind? when it came to poisoning them. This Butler case um, that came up next um, kind of backtracks a little bit and really um, sticks down to knowing and distinguishing between right and wrong and, and having that um, power of mind um, otherwise uh, voluntarily or so completely destroyed that his actions are beyond his control. So again, it, it kind of, um, it's right and wrong unless somebody has beaten you down to believe that that is um, beyond your control. So I have 
no willpower to to overcome that. So what what is Kufel actually influencing here? Um, and then they kind of, then they went real back. They went back in Eckhart and said, no, no, it's, it's right or wrong. You, if you know understand the difference between right or wrong, even if you knew it was wrong, you're you know you're definitely sane. And um, and return to that sort of strict interpretation of it. And then these cases, same thing with the this Schisler case, they, uh, this um, right and wrong, knowing right and wrong at the time of the act. And um, cases during the 1910s, 1920s kind of cling to that right and wrong defense of sanity, but they acknowledge that the mental state um, can, quote, uh, may affect the grade of the offense. So this could be the reason why um, this case was pled down to manslaughter instead of murder. And, um, you know, and finally, what happens if you decl are declared insane? So um, per the sta state statutes, you know, if you were to get your plea in there right at arraignment and you um, are then confined to the central state hospital for the insane until which time you are determined to be sane. So is that what you, you know, do you want to do that? Um, if you feel or if they feel that at the hospital you are sane, you would go before a jury um, in the county of the offense, so coming back to Walworth. Um, doctors could testify on your behalf, um, but, there, but a jury would have the final say. So these doctors could come up and say that you're mad as a hatter, or you're sane as all get out, but the jury d decides the final outcome. So no matter what they say, if the jury says you're insane, you're going back to the hospital. And so this might have been a gamble that she really didn't, or her lawyers really didn't want to take because, you know, with a prison sentence, you have the chance of getting out. In fact, she got out pretty darn early. And, um, but, you know, she could have been stuck in a mental institution f for a good long time or forever. So I'm, I'm continuing to explore these legalities implications and, and further in my research. So, like I always ask at the End of my sen um, sessions, who, who is ultimately responsible for this crime and why? Thank you, guys. <laughs>